Welcome to the Press Row. Behind the scenes stories from the world of sports media. Press Row. Inside and interviews from around the sports world. Now here's your host, Jonah Siegel. Welcome back, Jonah and the Press Row. So uh, super stoked for today's guest. Um, I will admit that I used to cringe when I used to get notified that he would be appearing on my radio broadcast because uh, he was so pro player back in the day when there was conflict between the players and the league, but always respected the fact that he was very much um, such a staunch supporter of, of being a player. Uh, loved him when he played for the Leafs, loved him when he played for the Rangers. He is Glenn Healy. Um, just really epitomizes everything there is about being a player. Love when he'd appear on Hockey Night in Canada. The kilt, his heritage, uh, great guy, very colorful. And I really believe that he belongs somewhere on the airwaves today. He's colorful, he's outspoken, he's funny. And uh, I think you'll really enjoy today's chat about what it means to be a player, what life after a player is, and some of the things going on in, in the game today, how we'd fix it and what the players really need uh, for life after their careers. So sit back and relax and enjoy today's discussion with Glenn Healy. Welcome back in the press row. Jonah Siegel here in Seattle, a uh, early start. So we don't know yet if it's going to be raining in Seattle. Odds are good. It's December, so you never know. Uh, we got football today. Lots of football today. It's nice. I like when that happens on a Saturday. I am uh, super stoked to have someone who I've admired for a long time. He's about to learn that I used to disagree with him a lot when he was on the radio because he was very pro-union and I was very pro-management. And man, was I dumb then, knowing what I know now. Uh, he is the president and executive director. That won't fit on the back of a hockey jersey anymore of the NHL Alumni Association. He is Glenn Healy. Glenn, how are you? You know, it's ironic that we look back on those times when I was so pro-union and, and was on TSN every day advocating for the players. And then you kind of life throws you a little bit more education. And I look back and think, man, was I dumb with some of the ideas that I had too. So uh, two different sides of the equator. And yet we both look back with revisionist history and think, we could have been a little smarter with some of our opinions if we had known just a little bit more. But uh, here we are. We survived it. And uh, nothing wrong with a little opinion, a little banter, and disagreement. At least I know you were listening. I'm the one. Um, that would be Saturday night. <laughs> so, so here's the funny thing, you know. Like, back in the day, what I always appreciated was we knew where you were going to come from. You were a player. And you represented your constituents. Um, and that was good. Like, you didn't, you know, I'm just going to raise the name. Like, Doug McLean was a management guy. And we knew where he was going to come from. And there were others like Doug. And, and that's okay. Um, my take always was, back then, owners own, players play. And... That's kind of the way the the economy works, stupid. And players should be thankful to have the jobs that they do. Um, you know, if a you know if a cap is coming, a cap is coming. And here we are today. And God, I wish the players didn't cave because the cap world really sucks from an excitement perspective. And I really wish they found a different way. That that's where I sit now as more educated after yeah. the fact. And I guess part of my, my uh, background would be I, I wore so many hats. You know, I was part of the NHL when we had Alan Eagleson, and we championed that. And then we, we had Bob Goodnow come on board. And there was a change in the weather with, you know, the strike in 1992 for player likeness. You know, having a player on a hockey card and, you know, the league would just put you on that without having you have any ability to say, well, there should be a little scratch going my way. And then I also wore a hat of being on the executive board and the negotiating board 
And then I was on the pension board for 13 years. Then I worked at the Players Association for many years. So there were a lot of things that led to me having the beliefs and the staunch beliefs that I have. To say I'm stubborn would be an understatement. So I, I do get it. Uh, but, you know, I look back on the, the lockout of, of 2004 and a couple of things now looking back strike me as, you know, there's always an end zone issue in any negotiation. And for the league, it was the cap. And what I guess I didn't adjust to was the constitution that Gary had in 94 and 92 when, well, well Ziegler in 92, and that's why Gary got his job in 93, uh, because of that uh, colossal failure of ownership with the 92 strike. But um, the change in his constitution led to the fact he needed very few people on the dance floor to say, we not play. And before it was all he needed was a couple of the big boys to say, oh, no, no, no we're playing and that's pretty easy when you've got New York and Toronto and I go down the list right. of teams. There were a number of factors strategically I could look at say that were flawed, but uh, uh, okay. uh, at the end of the day, uh, I still believe the players are the product. You could put every player in the NHL in one small junior B ice arena and it wouldn't have it full. And so, uh, you know, it is a great game. It's a great living. And, uh, you know, the, the CBA is 500 pages thick. And the reason it's 500 pages thick is we fought for a lot of those changes. So when I look at a Connor Bedard and I look at some of these younger players, I implore to them, do not give up some of the things that we fought so hard for. That's the reason your CBA is as thick as it is. That's the reason you have some of the benefits you have. Uh, that being said, uh, that is all in the rear view mirror. I've taken that down from my car and I have <laughs> brand new big mirror uh, window in the front and I look ahead and most of the things I do with the alumni, I now do in great conjunction with the league, with Gary Bettman and Bill Daly and their business group and their wellness group. And I do it also with the Marty Walsh and the Players Association. So I'm kind of Switzerland, uh, but I do, when the music stops, get a seat in a chair. And we do work so well together in so many different facets that help me to make tomorrow better than today for a bunch of players. So let, let's just stick to the, we'll come back to what you're doing today in a second, but I think part of the perceived challenge that the union has or the association has is participation and getting guys interested and engaged. The easy question is, why is that? Why is it that they are not engaged? Well, that comes from leadership. Uh, quite frankly, you know, I look at my group with your Gretzky's and your Lemieux's and your Messier's and your Paul Coffey's and Adam Graves, we are engaged. Uh, we take part in the daily stuff we do, the yearly planning that we have. And I could go into a meeting with the league with 3,800, and that's how many members we have, Glenn Healy's. Do you think I'm going to move the dial? If I show up at a meeting with a Bobby Orr and a Wayne Gretzky and a Mark Messier, again, I'll ask the same question. Right. Do you think I'm going to move the dial? <laughs> Clearly. And, you know, history's our teacher. I look back in 92 when we had our 10-day strike before the playoffs. And really, uh, we we were, as a group, we were about 350 players in the NHL at the time. It, it wasn't the 32-team league it exists now. And realistically, there were two players that put their feet down and said, we are not giving you our likeness. And that was Wayne Gretzky and Mario Lemieux. Right. And I think John Ziegler felt that we would cave and that we wouldn't stick to our guns like we did. And that wasn't going to be the case based on leadership we had at the Players Association, but also the leadership we had on the players' side. We did have a good and strong executive board with a whole variety of players, from tough guys to long-term guys to stars. We had it all. But the two stars were Mario and Wayne that were not going to cave. And when you have that ability to walk in a room with those two players telling you this is not happening, well, you're going to succeed. And I, I think when you look at that, and I still remember it was over player likeness, and my dad, who's from Scotland. Uh, really? I've war. never, I mean, I never heard this before. Yeah. He fought <laughs> in World War II, came over from Scotland after the war. There was no job in Scotland, no money. And Canada offered two pounds to emigrate. So we, they, they came and started a new life. Uh, but I can remember my dad saying, you're having a strike over player likeness. Who the hell would want to look like you? 
<laughs> but when you break it down now with hockey cards and EA sports games and, and all the things that go into the promotion of the name on the back of a sweater, as you have the name on the front, which would be the league crest, uh, that led to some significant strength, financial strength, which led to the ability to fight for better arbitration, better frequency, better pensions, better wellness, better SABH programs. You know, the list goes long as to what you can accomplish when you have that financial independence. And so that little strike, thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Mario. You were the guys that turned the worm for all of the players today to have a chance to play with. Um, yeah, I When I started, we had no arbitration. If they wanted to send me to Wuhan, I'd have to go. He right. had no choice but to go. And I can recall playing a New Haven uh, with guys, and we split the farm club with the Rangers that had 50 goals in the NHL just a few seasons before. You know, Mike Rogers, 50 goals in the NHL with Hartford. And he ends up in the minors with me and Glenn Hanlon and a whole bunch of people that shouldn't have been there because there, there wasn't things that we had fought for. So it's a different game. It's a changed world. It's not the same as it was in the 80s and 70s. And, and I'm thankful for that because uh, the players are the product. They're the ones every night that elevate you either at the edge of your seat, if you're not a good team, and if you are a good team, they get the fans out of the seat when they cheer for goals and wins and, and all the things that go with it. But um, it does get complicated. And for you know someone like my dad who fought in World War II for five years for no money, it is hard to see why anyone would have a strike when they're making the great sum of playing in the NHL of 60 some thousand dollars. So for those of you who don't know why Glenn keeps bringing up the topic of likeness in video games, it's because he still holds the record with Wayne Gretzky for being on a cover three times. So, you know, let's be honest. Wayne was scoring on me two of the three times. Whatever. <laughs> so, hey, come on now. Yeah, you know, so I, that, is, I mean, that, is, that is that is a record that it is that's pretty impressive. Yeah, I'm just hoping Bedard only plays three years. Uh, then I have a chance of keeping it. But uh, I imagine someone's going to rock it past me. But, <laughs> you know, hey, today in the NHL, when you think about it, and, and I'll give uh, kudos to Gary Batman in the league, you know, there were 1,100 players that played last year in the NHL. That's 1,100 jobs. That's 1,100 families. That's 1,100 people get a bit of a pension. That's benefits for 1,100 people. So my 350 back in 1992, now to their 1,100, uh, that is, uh, a, uh, if you're going to make a living somewhere, and trust me, I've tried many things after I retired, there is nothing better than playing in the NHL and doing what you have dreamt of doing since you were four years old. So the game is bigger, bolder, 32 teams, franchise values are selling for almost a billion dollars, 950 million for did I say this right? The Ottawa Senators? Okay, yes. I did say it. Yeah. So uh, it's, a, it's a different world than what it was back um, a number of years ago when we were cutting our teeth and trying to figure out what we were as an association. What Ted Lindsay created for me so that I could drive on the roads he paved. And what I did to put guardrails up so that the current players can drive on those roads with a protective source. So as players, we work together to make a difference. So if I heard you correctly, if the players want to battle the escrow battle or they want to change anything measurably in the next CBA, it's still a stars league and it's going to take the stars to get the 1100 players to move the needle. Is that right? Well, strategically, if it was me that was sitting uh, with the bat phone, um, I would have a couple of numbers on speed dial. Uh, McDavid would be one, clearly. Sidney yep. Crosby would be two. Um, I wish Patrice Bergeron had not retired, but I'm happy he has now because he's part of my team. But right. uh, there, there are a number of players, I think, that uh, you, you just have to look at some of the other sports and the gains they've made in, in basketball. And uh, they have health care, you know, universal for all, all the players, even when they retire. There's a good reason. Michael Jordan. Magic Johnson, a bunch of players stood up and said, you know, uh, we are going to take part in this negotiation and help the 12th player on the roster or the guy who wears the T-shirt on the bench who every time they score a point stands up and screams and yells. And I thought to myself, I could do that job. I really could, except I'm 5'8". Uh, but that being said, uh, that would be a good strategic play. But, you know, I don't know if there really is any end zone item that would cause the catastrophe that 
you know, that existed in 2004. Uh, you know, it was a, a crazy time and the, the cap was on the table and the cap arguably uh, should and could have been on the table in 2008. That was kind of a game plan. But guess what happened? You went to the Olympics. That's right. To lock people out if you're going to Nagano. And then you had expansion. Pretty tough to have a war dispute and labor dispute if you are going to expand this league. And so at some point. Uh, there was the opportunity for for that end zone item to be negotiated by the league. Look, at CBA is a moving and, and living document that can change and can change on either side. And uh, I, I think realistically to eradicate escrow would eradicate the system of 50-50. It just doesn't exist. That's what escrow does. I think you need a, a good base of education for the players so they fully understand what escrow is. You know, your contract is never your contract. It's a range based on what the revenues in the league are to be created. You know, when we sat through a pandemic and we looked at games on TV and we saw no fans in the crowd because of the pandemic, it would take an idiot to figure out or not figure out that they would take a little bit of a loss in revenue <laughs> to create this 50-50 imbalance, which would create for more escrow. So like, those are the type of things, what goes in that bucket of player share at Article 50 that, you know, those are negotiated items, but the system itself, you know, that is one that has been entrenched now for 20 years. And so, you know, if you're a part of the player association, in some ways you may not have liked 2004, but I would take your rear view mirror out of your car and look ahead and find ways to do World Cups, to create an international calendar with Olympics, to create things that are going to generate the revenue you need, you need to make this 50-50 more appealing to players that pay escrow into it, but educate them as to the fact that, yes, you signed a $10 million contract, but it's not $10 million. It could be 11 if revenues go the way they're going. It could be nine if there are unforeseen things like a pandemic like concussions, which may put uh, you know 60 players out of a lineup at any point during the season. These are things that are uncontrollable, but are part of the systematic issues. So you've had a storied career, 15 plus years. You've won a Stanley Cup. Unbelievable, exciting career as a broadcaster. Worked through the, the PA. And now you've landed, not now. You're currently in a role working with alumni. Perspective is a pretty interesting thing as you as you evolve. You know, what a lot of people don't recognize is that we end up, we take kids out of their homes at a relatively young age because they're super talented. We pull them from in, in many cases out of their homes. They they live in with other people. And then they, you know, they, they're told they're special, they're going to be great. And then they get drafted and then they go play. And if they're lucky, they do. And then something happens at the ripe old age of 30 something, maybe. 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 And, and then in, insert the prices right. Wah, 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 and then their career's over. And then they end up in front of you. And if they're lucky again, there's no issues, but then they've got to stare at the rest of their lives and figure out what to do. How has perspective changed as you kind of move through the different roles of your life as the evolution of a player? Well, that sounded so bleak. Oh my gosh, where do I go from here? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, at least there's a you know, hopefully hopefully there's a nest egg that you've built up over that time, but there are oh, lots of issues to uncover there. Yeah, I, you, you look at it, you put it in perspective, and you're, you're absolutely right. The, the average age of an NHL player today is 27. The average career is under three years. Okay, and that sound that you made, the won't, won't, won't. Okay, I, we just went to a, 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 a transition program with a bunch of retired baseball players. There are almost 200 baseball players. And the question was asked, how many baseball players retired under their own volition? One player put up his <laughs> Okay, so I, I do understand that part of it. I understand this. You have a very short career, a glorious career. No other job will you ever do that will satisfy you like that, un unless you have a calling somewhere else and that really, really uh, fills your boots. But for the most part, 
that short career is the best you'll get. And and at a, a, an age younger than 30, you're told that's it. And now you have a long life. And for me, that short career, as exceptional as it is, your long life should be equally as great because all those qualities that you learned on the ice, this unselfishness, the sacrifice, the discipline, the hard work, the when the chips are down, you're the one you know, who drives into a storm and doesn't drive away from it. That, that's what you do. That's what you've always done. You know, and that's what you have to transfer off the ice. Every single player retires. I don't care who you are. You will retire. Every player that currently plays today will become an alumni. Yes, it's a sad day when you get a letter from me and Marty Walsh. It says, welcome to the alumni. <laughs> it's a sad day. And Marty and I have talked about that. Yeah, sorry, Marty, but I think it's time to send this letter. What do you think, you know? Uh, because you always think, uh, you know, maybe next year, you know, these rookies aren't going to work out in Chicago and, you know, they need someone with Bedard and, I, and I'll jump on board there. And right. it, typically the phone just doesn't ring. So again, let's, that's what it looks like to be an NHL player, right? You finish playing and your phone goes quiet. You're not the guy that you once were where everyone wants a piece of you. You're not the guy who can call up and say, I need Taylor Swift tickets. And could you get me those? Sure. <laughs> Do you want to sit on the stage or backstage? Right. Okay. That doesn't happen. And then the biggest thing with players, we are all built around structure. 1030 skate, you know, 1130 bus. We have our meal at one o'clock. We'll typically relax in the afternoon. 430, we'll get the bus back to the rink. 530 power play meeting. 6 o'clock penalty kill meeting, 6.15 general meeting, then you'll have your warm-up, then you'll have your 7.03 puck drop, rinse and repeat, do it again tomorrow. You retire, where is your structure? Where is your purpose? And it disappears. And so for a lot of players, not a lot, but there are some that that transition becomes difficult. And so that's, I think, where we step in as alumni, which is when I worked at the Players Association, my job was to make tomorrow better than today for players started with Ted Lindsay and then it carried on through arbitration, free agency, all the things that have the player's world better. And my world today is how do I make tomorrow better than today for players? They don't have arbitration or free agency, but they have things like maybe surgeries, maybe it's substance abuse, maybe it's a, uh, an issue with a family member, maybe it's an issue with your spouse. All of these things, my job is to build up that library services with social workers and medical concierges to make sure that players can have a better tomorrow today. And when my phone rings, I don't say I'm sorry. So that, that to me is the premise of what we are as a unique group. We need to protect one another. We need to take care of one another. We are a unique brotherhood. And that would be my job on a daily basis. Not complicated, but certainly a, a big task. And that's, I think, the thing that our team has done. We've championed it to not have to pick up the phone and say I'm sorry. How surprised would the average fan be with how often that phone rings? Uh, they wouldn't want my job. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, very, very challenging. We have 3,800 players. We have uh, 1,300 players that are European. Uh, and to put it in perspective, there's about 1,200 Americans that have played in the National Hockey League. And the Euros are at 1,300. And the Americans had a 60-year head start. So the challenges you have in Sweden for healthcare are not the same challenges we have in the United States for healthcare or the challenges you have in Canada for healthcare. That's just one example. Uh, but the challenges are equally great with regards to that transition. You know, Finnish players, Swedish players, uh, players from the Czech Republic, German players, players from Russia, they have the same issues that we have over here in North America. Maybe you don't hear about them and, and read about them on X, if they call it that now, uh, but they are equally as grave if you don't have money, typically. No, I don't care what your profession is. That's what you think about all the time. If you don't have your health, I don't care what your profession is. I don't care if you're the president of the United States. That would be all you think about. So it, country to country, state to state, it doesn't matter. The issues are kind of the same. Uh, but, you know, I think the biggest thing is when I came on board, we filled up our um, our roster, so to speak, with a bunch of qualified people on the medical side, the financial literacy side, and once players find out that there are help and hope, uh, they'll call or the spouse will call. And so the, the phone rings and that's okay. That's your job. And when you are complaining about that, go do something else. So in, in doing research for this, Glenn, I was pleasantly surprised to read a lot 
about work you're doing directly with spouses and that it yes. may not be the player who calls that it's actually the spouse who calls that's uh pretty progressive it is and you know what i i think too we we hired first sports entity to hire a female social worker um and uh, she works a lot with some of the players that have alzheimer's dementia and parkinson's you know we will never have an out of bounds we have players where multiple concussive blows have led to a lack of functional integration in players' worlds. And a lot of times the um, the spouse is the caregiver. She's the one who's taking care of this guy who was once bigger than life, playing in a uniform in front of 20,000 people with maybe a letter on his, on his shoulder. And now he's wandering the highway and doesn't know his name and can't remember friends and right. can't remember conversations he had 10 minutes ago. And that that's a hard, any caregiver from anyone that uh, has any of those ailment, ailments, it's difficult. And so she works directly with probably close to 37 spouses now. Um, you know, marriage is tough, it's tough in the real world for anybody. It's tough for hockey players. And that family dynamic, if we can work to keep that dynamic together, that would be another important piece. And there's just something about um, having more of a female voice than, say, a Glenn Healy locker room voice. You know, I might have two ears and might be caring, but I'm not a professional. And so we tried to fill in the blanks. And, you know, Ben Scrivens, who is an, a goaltender, goals are always the smartest. I just want to throw it. Uh -huh. Yeah, but uh, Ben has got all his degrees for social work, and he works again a lot with you know peer to peer, player to player, and you know finding out what players' needs are. And then we have uh, uh, another gentleman who's worked thirty years in the field and has seen every major drug issue, gangs, fight gangs, hell's angels. He's worked with them all, and we've jumped on board, and he's now working with us. And so. You know, we try to fill up all those areas because we know that these are needs for our players and and their spouses. If it's not right within your household, it's probably not right with you as a player. And so we understand that and we've acted on it. The other sports, they're starting to listen and they're starting to follow a little bit. You know, we were the first in the CBD world. They're starting to follow. And, uh, you know, I'm not one to back away from something I think is going to give us help and hope. So... A lot of times you discover things and that will cause you to make changes. So you've now been doing this for enough time that if you sit with Marty and you sit with Gary, which you now say you work with them, if you were going to sit down with both of them at breakfast tomorrow and say, guys, at the next CBA, this is the one thing that you need to do for players moving forward. What's the one thing that you would fix? I wouldn't even wait for the CBA. If if they could call me this morning, healthcare. Tell me other more. Sports have it. Other sports have found a way to put it on the uh, the repertoire of uh, things that are most important for players. And uh, in our world, the way it works um, under some of the leadership of the NHLPA, uh, when you leave the game, you had one choice. And that if you want to keep your health care, you have 120 days back in the day to decide to keep it. And you typically thought you were going to play by the time you got to the 100th day. You're still, that December date was still right there. Like hang, I on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let, let, me, let me interrupt just so we can, we can help the audience and myself. So irrespective of years played, you're not guaranteed health care. Is that correct? Zero. Zero. Okay. Nothing. Now, hang on. Just wait. I have to, I have to help people out here. So... Major League Baseball, Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA. Is that the same? So they are all different uh, players associations and different alumni associations. And they all have different remedies for a health care plan. So, okay. for instance, in football, they have yes. 700 Cleveland Clinic full-blown head-to-toe medicals that they have every year. It's called the Trust. And it's in the tune of north of $25 million that is spent on uh, a, a medical wellness group for N NFL players and in baseball, we know what baseball and, and the exploits and what Marvin Miller created for them. And in basketball, they have a healthcare plan for their players. But in when, when, a, in, in, when, hang on. when a player retires in any sport, if they hit a, a minimum milestone, do they get life lifetime healthcare? 
So in, in certain sports, yes, they absolutely get that. In our sport, you can keep your health care plan, but you pay for it. And it is just a paltry sum of about $36,000 US a year. So wow. you can imagine that players have not kept it. Okay. You would expect, yes. unless they work for teams and they pay for it. Right. And so we had probably 97% of our players that just went into the stream and just desperately looked for something for a healthcare plan for them and their families. Okay. And something probably isn't good enough. And so what we have created and, and what we want to uh, have happen is a plan that wraps around whatever they have to make it better so that a player who is, you know, in Canada, we, yes, if you're going to pass away, you can go to a hospital, it's free, mm -hmm. but you have three people watch you die. I don't think that's fair for players that have helped to build this game in the original six. And so that's one example, but um, that's what I would fight for immediately. And I think the players deserve it. And I don't think um, Marty Walsh or any, anybody at the league level can look at me in the eyes and say that Bobby Orr doesn't deserve health care. Okay. Or Mario Lemieux doesn't deserve some form of health care. And, and go across the board with, with all of our players that deserve it and they should have it. And I'm going to fight. Is the, is the ask at a minimum number of games? You're just saying you play one game, you're entitled. No, there's thresholds. Okay. Like, Clearly, you know, uh, there are you know, players that played 50 seconds, you know, that were put in goal for the last minute because things were kind of going wonky. So, right. But the, uh, the guy who drove the Zamboni, right. put him in the net. That's, that's not the spirit of what we're creating. It's the player who has created a craft in his career. And, you know, th this game does a couple things to you, but it bangs you up. Yeah. You know, when you watch some of the older players walk, you, you grimace, you think, hmm. You know, I'm a I'm not old by any stretch of the imagination, 61. So you might think I'm old, but I'm not. Uh, but I'm sitting with you know two artificial hips uh, brought about from playing goal and doing things that you should not do as a goaltender to any joint. And so I know I'm at least if I pass away, I'm worth a thousand dollars of scrap metal. So I'm good there, right? We had that, <laughs> but uh, but realistically, you know, our, our the game beats you up and you're probably 20 years chronologically older than you really should be if you're 50 years old and walking around. So, I mean, that's one small example, but that to me is something that would not cost a lot of money, would take both sides to agree that there, there is a price that these players have paid and um, it's the right thing to do. You know, when Gary Batman took over, um, there was some angst with some of the older players about what had happened with the league the Bathgate lawsuit, there was a bunch of things that had happened. And uh, Gary had told the players, Bathgate and Lindsay at the time, that this was going to be a different NHL. And, and he's kept to his word. It has been a different NHL. We have increased their pensions through supplemental gifting. It's not a pension, but it is tripled in some cases, players' pensions. Um, but th there is one more brick to put in the wall. And he should put the brick in the wall with the Players Association. And... How close do you think you are? I think Can I'm you... close. Oh, good. I, I'm not going to stop fighting until uh, they take away this chair, computer, my <laughs> key the office, my coffee cup that I drink out of, and all the things that I think are important. I, I think the players deserve it, uh, and I, I think their families deserve it. And uh, healthcare, at a bare minimum, uh, for the players that have built the game, is something that in a six billion dollar league with a team that sells for a billion dollars in Ottawa, that uh, this is something that uh, the, the owners, the league, and uh, the players should all share. Because at one point, uh, they will be retired. And yeah. they will look back and think, uh, we put a pretty good brick in the wall. And trust me, every time a, a retired player, like a Messi or an Adam Graves, walks into a locker room and knows that the current players have helped to take care of their family, Man, that is a great deal of respect that'll go both ways. Once a player, always a player. If that doesn't happen, then the, when that, that same group walks into a locker room and that current player has said, nah, I don't think you guys deserve it, that will be a different conversation, I can tell you. So you have um, the unique 
one of the you're one of the unique guys who didn't play junior hockey. You went the U.S. college route, and and for a young, spry, sixty-one year old, that's pretty unique, given the era that you played in to play in the NHL, win a Stanley Cup, uh, not for Toronto, um, and um, but to not have gone junior to play U.S. college is is certainly unique for the era in which you played most kids i would imagine that you played with did not go that route it is a hell of a lot more popular today given what you just said about seven minutes ago about how short the career is you know you live in i assume you're somewhere you're in toronto so you're in the gta you're in the gta you see all these kids playing the lunatic parents have aspirations of their kids playing in the NHL. And even if lightning does strike them twice on that same day and they do get a sniff, knowing what you know today, if your next door neighbor rang your doorbell and said, my kid has two options, junior or college, what would you tell them? And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to put a shield around you so that the folks in junior hockey don't shoot you. But what would you say? Oh, uh, hey. I think it's, you know, it's like a box of chocolates. Like, it's different for every every player. Connor Bedard, you know, you could tell at eight, he was exceptional. And and then at nine, was exceptional. I, look, I played against Gretzky when he was 12. And I can recall walking into the rink, and the rink was full. And I thought, what's going on? Like, I mean, I'm 12. I've never right. seen this. And they were, oh, this Gretzky's playing. And I thought, Gretzky, who's he? Give me a break. We're 12 right. years old. Right. Anyways, I, I think he had six goals. He could have had 12. I mean, it was just, oh, now I see why. Okay. So for certain forget, players, forget those. Forget I'm talking forget, about the, the average really good kid. If you learn, you earn for the rest of your life. And when I was going through that process, you know, again, parents came from Scotland. It wasn't a lot of the Healy clan going through university. And my parents thought it would be so important that you could maybe arguably be, be the first Healy educated. But wouldn't that be a unique thing? <laughs> and, uh, and honestly, I, I just didn't see, I was a late bloomer. I didn't have the talent that people foresaw. I wasn't drafted in any league ever, whether it was junior A, whether it was provincial junior A, whether it was the NHL, wasn't drafted. So, you know, clearly on draft day, when they don't announce your name, you know, the writing is kind of on the wall, um, more so like they put when they type in your name on the Stanley Cup, like it's there for real. And so for me, it was important that I go get an education. It gave me the time I needed to progress. It also took away a lot of the pressure. If I didn't make it, I didn't really care. I had two majors. I had a major in marketing and a major in finance. So I'm going to get a job somewhere. And that's going to, but that, that took away the pressure to play in the NHL. Did I have a chance to play in major junior? Yes. I had a chance for the Peterborough Peets. And uh, they were a team that won the Memorial Cup that year. They had a starting goalie who was exceptional, was a top prospect. And the, the ask was for me to go and bolster the team and do a lot of watching. And I refused to go. And the coach at the time basically called me a loser and that I would never make it to the NHL. And, um, uh, that coach and I ended up winning a Stanley cup together. So I'm glad I never listened to him back in that day. You can fill in the blanks as to who it was. Um, initials MK, um, oh, I've given away too much, uh, but anyway, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the bottom line for me was, you know, I, I needed to get a degree. I, I didn't have the talent I thought to make it. And for anyone that's not sure, or for anyone that, uh, you know, is, is questioning what they should do. There's never a bad decision to get more education and to take more time. And a lot of the scouts are happier. If you, if you go to university, it gives them more of a look, more time for you to develop, more time for you to play with men, you know, versus you're 18, you're in the system, sign you to an entry level deal. If you're not quite ready yet, by the time you're 20 or 21, you're done. Like they aren't resigning you because they've got another seven rounds of players that they've announced at the podium times three years that are waiting to take your job. So, so there's benefits, pro and con. For certain players, there's only one road. And I would uh, argue that there's a lot that have looked back and regretted the decision 
to try to make it through the major junior ranks and have never gotten any further than the East Coast League. If you were back on the Hockey Night panel and the Bedard Perry story was on, what would your commentary have been? Well, I think Hang it's on. Con- for those for those of you who are not watching on YouTube, the smirk on Glenn's face is pretty epic right, right. now. So Sunday, I'd be looking for work. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> Saturday night. Actually, you know, I think it might be Saturday night at about, you know, and Ron McLean takes us off the air. Right. Three, two, one, uh-huh. phone ring right away. I think it's very unfair what an 18 year old was put through uh, and very unfair what the family was put through to have to defend your mom a month into your NHL career when all it would have taken is to get ahead of the curve with this situation. Uh, When I first heard about it, I did not believe it for a second. I thought it was ridiculous. And I thought the same thing I thought of before I got fired from Hockey Night in Canada was Twitter is poison. Like here it is. It they just they made another birthday cake. Happy birthday. You've done it again. And how that was all created. And you know, the other side of it is the guy who woke up to that story on a Monday and then decided to go to work and actually make an honest living and and didn't read about it again. He probably to this day still thinks it's true. It happened. I read about it. It's real. And not like you or I, where we'd follow it every day just to make sure we're on top of some of the news items. Very unfair for the player. Very, very unfair uh, for the team not to get ahead of the curve. Very unfair. Uh, It did happen days later. And at that point, uh, the toothpaste was well out of the tube. So to me, um, it was not handled right in any shape or form by his management, by his ownership, by the team. And and this 18-year-old should not have had to face any of that. And it, in in my mind, was disgusting that he would, at an early age, early in his career, have to be faced with asking stupid questions about that. And uh, shame on them. And I would if I would wholeheartedly apologize to his family for something as ridiculous. And that's why I would be unemployed on Sunday morning. <laughs> but, what? What? How hard was it being on both sides of an issue? Like, let, let's go back to the Bertuzzi issue. Because you're in the union, the association, sorry, and you've got both the victim and the perpetrator, and you've got to wear both hats. Yes. So that's, I think, the misunderstanding is that when you show up at a Sean Avery hearing or yeah. when you show up at a Bertuzzi hearing and you're, you're, you know, you're defending the player, you're not defending the act if the act was predatory, if the act was intentional if the act was carried across 100 feet if it was an act that created an injury you're not defending that act what you're defending is the process to discipline that player so if that act is three games it is three games and the player should pay the piper so to speak because he is he has done the the bad hockey plays do go bad and they will pay the price but the process, the precedent, those things have to be defended because you can't have someone with an opinion take a magic wand and say 65 games because I can say that. If it's 65, you have to tell me why you got to 65 and what is the precedent that got you there. And that happens in every legal case. You know, murder is murder and it's defined by a, a, a trial Right. It is defined by uh, intent, manslaughter charge, like a whole bunch of things that lead to what would be the charge and the crime and what you're doing for time. And that's no different. So I'm not there defending what the player has done. What the player has done, sometimes you can't defend, but I'll defend the process and the precedent. And also, um, you know, sometimes hockey plays go bad. You know, game happens at an incredible speed. You have a weapon in your hand. There's no out of bounds and certain times things happen in a blink of an eye and a wrong decision is made from a hockey standpoint. And that player still pays the price, but that decision then should, that should be taken into consideration with the discipline of that player. So that's, I think the biggest thing, they always think that you're there 
standing up defending the player and you know here's pictures of him as a an altar boy and here he is uh with the unicef box at halloween and oh my gosh he was also candy striper at the hospital and so let's just forget all this happened that's not the way it works it's here's the cases here's what you've done in the past here's what should happen in the future you, you i assume given your role you watch a lot of hockey still you're a fan of the game yes yeah for sure. Bagpipes and hockey, coast to coast in this house. Yes. So if, again, you're you're having breakfast tomorrow with Gary and Marty. And at one point, I believe you were part of the competition committee. I'm not sure if you still are, but you were. I am not, no, but I was, yes. If you were going to make one either big or subtle change to the game, what would it be? Oh, He's now rolling no. his eyes at me, for those of you. No, know. I, I, I mean, look, at I think the game is, is a great game. Um, I, I do say this. I, I would look at just from a – I always think of the game from the fan first. If it's good for the fan, yep. then it'll be good for the, the, the game. And if it's good for the fan and it's good for the game, it'll be good for the players. Mm -hmm. There'll be some excitement there, and the fans will then want to – come and pay for a ticket and, and that'll drive revenue and increase the thank you now we have our recipe for success uh -huh. <laughs> right. two plus two is five now people say that at western michigan they actually taught us that so it's just bad math by the way just let you right. know that but um you know I, the, the the overtime it's five minutes it was created for five minutes because there were trains leaving union station to go to original six franchises and you had to get on the train if we're going to say, can we not make it 10? Right. Like the first five minutes is somewhat exciting. Uh, five more minutes wouldn't be that bad. I mean, I've been to many concerts and gosh, <laughs> I do love it. When Paul McCartney plays one more song. Right. <laughs> I, I think Taylor Swift did want three more. Right. Just saying. So what's the big rush to get on a train that no one takes anymore? You have your own plane. Right. You can get on when you get on. All right. So if it does go 10 and you still then are stuck with it, one of the most exciting moments I had as a broadcaster was in the Sochi Olympics when TJ Oshie against Russia had shot after shot after shot in the shootout. I, the other night in Mon Montreal, they went nine shooters, 10 shooters. After you get past three, go pick who you want. Right. I want to see Ovechkin shoot every time. Right. <laughs> Excuse me, Blake. Huh? I want to see Crosby every time. That to me would be a, a small change that I would make, and it would be best for the fans. So you're sitting in Toronto. They've struggled mightily come playoffs. They played really well in the regular season. Not much has changed. What gives? You're not satisfied with one playoff round in 18 <laughs> years? Is that what you're saying? Oh my gosh! I'm not. Right? I, I'm not that much younger than you, so unfortunately. Yeah, you know, uh, the the problem you have in some ways, and everyone knows the issues in Toronto from a cap standpoint, you're so heavy-handed in that the players that you have under contract, you're they're there to outscore your mistakes. What they do best, and they do it well. I mean, the regular season numbers are extraordinary, better than when I played on certain seasons, and we had a more complete team with probably eight guys on the team that could have been captain. You know, we, we had guys playing on the third line that Joe Newendike could have been captain. So could Gary Roberts. So could Shane Corson. Uh, so could Brian Leach. So could Matt Sundin. So <laughs> where do I stop? Like, that's right. one team, all yeah. that leader, right? Um, but because you are, uh, you, some of the areas you haven't been able to kind of put the money into your, your house, so to speak. You spend it all on the roof and the yeah. siding. There's not much left for the furnace or for goalie or for a defense core. And the teams that do win, typically, they're strong up the middle. Uh, and, and look at the, the dynasties that have won over the past number of years, uh, whether it's Chicago or it's LA or Boston, name the teams that have won, strong up the middle, a defense core that usually has a Norris Trophy winner or candidate on it, whether it's a Den Ochera or Victor Hedman or Duncan Keith, and typically a goaltender like Vasilevsky or somebody in net, a Tuka Rask, a Tim Thomas, somebody 
who then, you know, has got his name around a Vezina or around a Conn Smythe. Uh, when Brian Leach won the Conn Smythe in 94, you could have given it to Mark Messier, but you could have easily given it to Mike Richter. And no one would have said, how the heck did they give it to Mike Richter? Because the save he made on Bury was the, the changer for us in that series with Vancouver. So those recipes for success, uh, those are things maybe you can change, but it becomes more difficult in a cap world. But the areas where they are uh, missing, uh, when playoffs come, you some nights, most nights, particularly as you go to rounds two, three, and four, you can't outscore your mistakes. You play many different teams. Some may play a defensive game. Some may play a physical game. Some may play that run and gun system that you like to play, and you're better at it than them. But you're going to play all different kinds to get to the Stanley Cup. And if you're good at one little game, you're not going to be good at the other ones that let you get through from round to round. Does it surprise you that the guy at the top played for some really good hockey teams who are structured the way you are has had lack of success and keeps running it back the same way? Well, I don't think, you know, in some ways you were handed a pandemic, which led to a flat cap. You've had a flat cap for, I don't know how many years now. So right. where you anticipated, you know, this game going and we're going to the Olympics and it's going to be in Korea. Like, we're, we're, like think about that. Like what's that going to, that's going to catapult our game into the, in South Asia, which is going to lead to some great uh, scores and revenue. And then you can't go because of COVID and you could put fans in the seats because of COVID. And I never expected that. I mean, I told my staff when it first happened, take a week off, see in a week. Boy, did I miss that runway right. by three weeks. You know, so there are some unforeseens. And then now because of that, you know, you would like to trade a player. He's not he's not um, recognizing his shortfalls. But to get out of those shortfalls, not many players want to take on your $12 million player without giving you a $12 million player back because they've got the same issues as you. And realistically, when the cap first came into play, I think everyone thought the top seven teams would race up to it, spend to the top. And then there'd be a bunch that would just stay down the middle, you know, just like, let's see how it goes. And then there would be the bottom feeders that they're just going to follow a budget. Well, they threw that rule book out and everybody seems to race to the cap. And so more and more teams probably 16, 17 teams have either spent right to the limit or are over with long-term injury. And I don't think that was ever designed in the system, but in the compete game with owners that want to win, that is your new system. And so as a result, you again, you can't outscore your mistakes. Well, some of your mistakes, you can't find a way to out-trade them because teams are well aware of what they want to get rid of to get them out of the same situation you're in. Last question, because you've been very generous with your time. It appears to me that we're at a challenging time for your favorite profession, goalies, and that it just seems that for whatever reason, there is not the same quality of goaltender around the league that we typically have had. And I'm not poking at anyone specifically, but Growing up, watching the game evolve over the years, you always had eight to 10 exceptional goalies in the league that you said, if that guy was on that team, they'd win the cup. And I've had this debate with some friends here saying, quarterback goalie, you know, if you had one of those guys, you could win either a Super Bowl or, or a Stanley Cup. And we're finding it harder these days to say which goalie you'd want to win the Stanley Cup. And it's pretty slim pickings in our opinion right now. It appears that, you know, the days of the Shakutami goaltender seems to be a long way in a rearview mirror. Has something happened? Like we're not developing that, that's that really good goalie anymore. And he's nodding his head for those of you not watching on YouTube again. Or am I well, wrong? You are, well, first off, there is no replay on the score sheet. And I can recall playing against the Ottawa Senators uh, when, you know, Curtis Joseph was our goalie. And uh, they used to do zone time, how long they were in your zone. 
and Curtis and I would sit on the bus together and we'd look at zone time and it'd be like, Ottawa was in our zone for like 38 minutes. <laughs> we'd win. <laughs> and, you know, I can, players would come back and say, man, I did a great job checking Yashin. And I'd look at them and go, you did? <laughs> Who did? It? Not you. Okay, so yeah, you're right. Like a goaltender can cover up so many mistakes and warts in your lineup and end. You know, I, I look at, and I would just, you know, this is strictly opinion. Scouts typically are told if the goalie's under six foot two, don't even watch him play. Don't even draft him. Like we're not drafting guys unless they're six five, six six. Okay. And these goaltenders that that play, there's just a complete lack of instinct in their game. It's all percentages. You know, Lafreniere scored a goal the other night for the Rangers. He's behind the goal line, and the goaltender is on his knees from Winnipeg. The, the, the net is about this big right. from behind the goal. Like, it's not even that big. Stand on your feet and use a little bit of instinct, please. Because as that player takes good ice and goes to bad ice, the net shrinks. And yet you have given him the ability with your flying VH4 reverse to create a room for him just to find a spot. And guys are finding those spots. So I would say more instinct, um, maybe less of that. We're just going to use our ability to cover uh, as much net as we can because we're big. and and understand, yes, what's in front of you. You know, I used to know every player and when they changed their tape, when they changed their curve, who liked to shoot on a two-on-one, who liked to pass, knew all that. That was all instinct. Uh, but um, I don't think a lot of them are playing with a lot of instinct. It's all percentages. And I would say, use a little bit more of that and understand what's in front of you, yes, but also what's behind you. Where can guys score on me? what's available with regards to the net. And I don't think that exists in some of the guys today. He is Glenn Healy. He is the president and executive director of the NHL Alumni Association. He is sorely missed on our televisions on Saturday nights and on our radio stations. Glenn, you should be on the air somewhere. If you are in the media or in the production business, you should be putting this man back on the airways. We need more opinions. He is smiling and laughing if you're not watching uh we need more refreshing opinion uh that is my opinion uh i miss hearing your voice even though i used to disagree with it a lot back in the day we do uh we have too many people nodding their heads and saying the same thing over and over again it'd be refreshing to hear more colorful disagreement from time to time and it, it's great to see you it's great to hear your voice and i hope that uh Perhaps as we get closer to playoffs, we can have you come on and we can do some playoff talk as we get closer. Thank you again for doing this. Glad to be part of it. Thanks very much. And happy holidays and Merry Christmas for those who celebrate that as well. Thank you. Thank you for listening to today's episode of In the Press Row. Thank you to Glenn Healy for joining. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Really great talk about life as a player after a player. Uh, interesting discussion about the whole Corey Perry, Connor Bedard thing. Uh, I think you'd agree with me that we really miss having Glenn somewhere on our airwaves on a regular basis. Somebody should be putting Glenn on the air. He is a breath of fresh air. Uh, we miss him on Saturday nights. Somebody colorful, uh, opinionated. We could really use that. If you want to appear here on the press row, please reach out to me. You can do it by email, Jonah at YYZ Sports Media on X or any of your social media handles. I'm at YYZ Sports Media. Please follow this or subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast or on YouTube. And we will see you next time. Happy holidays to everybody and see you in the new year.